evening. Thank you so much for joining us on our Wednesday night Bible study online. I'm Pastor Jacob. It's so great to be here. Uh, we are continuing our series on the parables. The last few weeks we've been talking about it. And Pastor, Pastor Johnny talked about this past Sunday about unforgiveness and forgiving others. And which leads us, actually, uh, I love how the, how the Holy Spirit works. Um, it leads us into this week's parable. This week's parable is actually it's, it's found in Matthew 18, and it isn't in any other gospel. Um, this parable, its context, it's, it's with the disciples asking Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? In verse 1, he launches into G this launches Jesus into a time of teaching uh, about the kingdom of heaven. And so, real quick, to catch you up, we're going to start actually in verse 21, but a little pretext to get you to verse 21. Let me fill you in the context of how we're going to get there so you know uh, what Jesus really is talking about, really. So in verse 2 through, two through 6, um, Jesus is talking about how one must have uh, be like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. And that's when we hear about the childlike faith. Let the children come to me, uh, those who are, have childlike faith. Uh, and then in verse 7 through 9, Jesus warns, uh, warns on a, a seriousness of, of guarding ourselves against temptation and how we do that. And he talks about that. And then in verse 10 through 14, Jesus shares the parable of the lost sheep. Now, last week, we didn't talk about the lost sheep. We talked about the prodigal son, the lost son. But it's in the same context of the lost coin and the lost sheep going in order in the other Gospels. And then in verse 15 through 20, right before this parable uh, this evening, we see the guidelines on how we're supposed to handle confrontation with, with people inside the, the, the kingdom of heaven. So... Getting all caught up to that, and which leads us into uh, the parable we're going to talk about this evening, it sparks this question of Peter. And I love Peter. Peter, Peter asks the questions that, that no one really wants to ask, but he's not afraid to ask them. So we're going to read in verse 21. It says this. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. See, from this decision on disciples uh, discipline, we get the question about forgiveness. How often, how many times, as a disciple ourselves, we are quick to, to talk about the discipline and slow to exercise the forgiveness part of it. Jesus had been talking and explaining to those who were uh, impatient who are willing and, and leads us up into this and this is where Peter asked this question what led Peter to ask this question really is the, the verses beforehand and he says how many times shall I forgive my brother or my sister before I uh, kick them really out of the, the family, the kingdom, the, the community see Peter here offered up his own solution by suggestion, suggesting seven times. Now, during this time, the Jews thought that they should forgive uh, repeated sin three times. This found it, is found in the Old Testament, um, if you want to go back and research it. Uh, so it, it seems that Peter was attempting to be gracious. Now, I, I say that because... He's been with they, he's been around Jesus for a while, and he knows Jesus' power and, and how he how he handles himself. So Peter's trying to make himself look good. But I said, how many times should we should forgive? Let's say seven, knowing back then they practiced three times. All right, so if he doubled the number, then he added one, it gives you the number seven. And it's it's that, that number seven, which is the, the holy number. Now, now that Jesus heard this question, he's quick to answer the question of Peter. And we find this in Matthew 18, 22. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. See, when you, when you hear this, Jesus is actually uh, giving a, a, a sarcastic answer, really. 
He gives a spark notes version of the parable of the, the unforgiving servant who offers a quick answer and says, no. No, no, Peter. Not, not seven times, but 77 times. See, the point here is not the number, although I, for a long time I thought that was the magic number and, and kept track. 77 times I ref, forgive somebody, and the 78th time that you do something wrong, now nah, you're done. You're gone. But he's really telling us it's, it's not about the, the really the number or the formula to keep track of how many times we need to forgive our, our Christian friends. friends. Jesus was not specifically a, a giving a number to his disciples to forgive others, but he clearly uses this in the parable of the unforgiven servant. So that's all to say just to get to the parable of where, uh, what we're going to talk about tonight. So in Matthew 23 through 35, we're going to read it, and then we're just going to break it down, discuss it, and how do we apply it to our lives. So again, open up your Bibles, not your phone, because you're watching, and let's, let's read. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle the accounts with his servants. As he began, began the settlement, a man who owed him ten thousand bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold, repay the, be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell to his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. And the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debts, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow, servants, the, his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged, Be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had him, the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw this, what, saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me? Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he would be able to pay back all that he owed. This is how my, he my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Now, as we, as we read this, remember, parables aren't historical events that happen. Rather, they are stories that Jesus uses to illustrate by illustrate points by placing them side by side for us to understand. Here we see that Jesus wants to make a point about forgiveness by telling this story. Jesus tells a story about with three characters, a king, God, the unforgiven servant, unbelievers, and another servant. These three characters tell us to the answers to um, the two important questions. How often should we, should we forgive and why we should, get, we should forgive? So first... How often should we forgive? Remember, remember Peter's question I talked about a little earlier? From the beginning, how often should we forgive? Jesus answers this, is not about the number, but about the heart. Peter is thinking that Jews have always taught about being three times, forgiving three times. But Jesus is uh, pretty radical, so maybe he says seven <coughs> Excuse me. Essentially, Peter is asking, what is the limit on our forgiveness? What, what's our limit, Jesus? Because surely there is a limit to our forgiveness. We all have a limit. So what is it? Whether we want to admit it or not, 
on how many times will we forgive someone? And Peter is wondering this. What should it be? Jesus answers it. Crazy, though. At this point, there, there was, there's no limit. Now, our natural reaction to this is, is why? Why isn't there a limit to the times we forgive somebody? Well, why are we... Why are we to forgive like this? Why should we forgive, forgive at all? Well, this is exactly the parable that Jesus is, is talking about. So let's, let's break it down verse by verse to help, help us out a little bit. So why should we forgive? So as you remember, the verse starts out with the parable of uh, talking about a servant and a king. Well, the king calls his servants to be to pay to what they owe to the king. A crazy uh, part that we find is a servant is unable, a servant having to answer for an unpayable debt to this king. The amount is ten thousand talents. It's just ridiculous. That, that, that amount of money. So here's what, here's what we're going to look at t t tonight. As my, as my good friend Shane Watson would say, let's, let's run some numbers. Right? That's, what, is, what is that equal to today? Now, a servant owned, so here we go. A servant owned how many? 10,000 talents. So we don't know the fraction in talents. Um, so let's put it in a number that we can that we can understand really. A denaro, one, one denaro is a, de a day's wage. One talent is six thousand denaro, denaro, or however you say it. I can't say it. We have dollar bills and coins. Back then, so one talent is worth six thousand denaros. So ten thousand talents would be equal to. Uh, let me see here. 10,000, carry the one, divided by three, lift it up, core math. Um, we could figure that out, but back then we had real math. Um, that's 60 million days of work. So that's about 164,383.5 years. See, this is an unpayable debt. That the the... The, the character back then is 10,000. Mera, which hence the, the, the word mermaid, is the largest numeral, numeral for which Greek, the Greek term exists. And the talent is the largest known amount of money. When the two are combined, the, uh, the effect is like in the zillions. So, according to my quick running numbers, and running it by my... my uh, number cruncher, Mr. Shane Watson, that this is not a real good deal for the king. And, and my question is, is, how does he even get into that much debt? But somebody needs to go to Dave Ramsey. But the king justly says that the servant and everything he has has to be sold to make payment for his debt. Now, this payment would be just like uh, uh, like three cents to his, compared to what he owes to the king. It's, it's unthoughtable. The, the blindly forgiving would be, would be unthinkable. So, the servant, he racks up this debt that is blindly forgiven out of pity. This word, pity, is also translated as, a, as, a, as compassion or an act of love. Not because of what the servant could do or who he was, but out of the character of the king, the servant is forgiven. The first lesson here is that the king has incredible grace toward the servant's debts. So now we understand that part, going on to verse 18 through 30. Now the parable could have ended there and we could have had a a great message on, on what it means to be uh, of having grace and reveals the, the greatness and forgiveness of God to his servants of us. But that's not the only lesson in this parable. The reaction of the servant is appalling. 
Like, how he reacts is, is, is absurd. It's crazy. He goes out, tries to seek payment from a fellow slave, even lashing out on a slave by choking him. I mean, let's look at the, the, the servant who was so eager to collect on what it means today. He wasn't collecting a ton of money. He was only collecting a few. 700 coins. Several hundred. Not, not, even, a, not even a lot compared to what the other servant had. Now, just like the, the, other, the first servant did, this servant pleads with his fellow servant, as, as that one servant did for the king, and he, and he begs him for forgiveness. But a, a turn of events, he is met with no forgiveness and is immediately thrown into prison. What an ironic what is ironic here is that the servant, when he's thrown into prison, can't work off his debt. Well, he will, it will never be paid. The unforgiven servant knows this, but he is more, it's more about the character than the logic of his, of his actions. See, so many times, I, we're just stopping there, not really forgiving, is that we, we as humans, we act out of emotion other than logic. But that's a whole other sermon that I'm not going to get into right now, so let's continue on. The second lesson is, is the comparison of the unforgiven servant and the king. Lastly, the, the break it down the, the final chapters, 31 through 34, our story comes to an end with the king hearing about the situation. He's, he summons the servant, and then he punishes him as he did for the other servant. The same is true with this servant, though, that, that the king knows he will never be able to pay his debt. Never. Even if all of the servants got together and pulled all their money together and sold everything that they had, they still, which they wouldn't because this servant is a jerk and he doesn't deserve anything, they still wouldn't have enough money. There, there's just no way. I mean, if you want me to calculate it, I can, I can talk to my, my numbers cruncher, Mr. Shane Watson, and it's still not enough money. The servant had to, been, had to been sentenced to an eternal punishment. So this final lesson teaches us that the, the frightful fate of those who don't believe. See, this parable of the servant teaches us that we forgive because God first forgave us. We have been forgiven much, so we must have the opportunity, the ability, the perspective, the power to forgive much. C.S. Lewis writes this, To be a Christian means to forgive the unexcusable because God has forgiven the unexcusable in you. Another way of saying this is, is our forgiveness is revealed in our forgiving. The person who struggles to forgive is the person who doesn't have an accurate understanding of their own sin. I will say that again. The person who struggles to forgive is the person who doesn't have an accurate understanding of their own sin. Not anyone else's, own, anyone else's sin, but theirs. The reality is, is that sin causes us to see the magnitude of our forgiveness. That's the, the starting point of, of being forgiven. When the servant goes before the king, he pleads for forgiveness. He sees this. Have patience with me, he says this. Have patience with me, and I will pay everything back. See here, the servant, he's pleading for, for patience and mercy, because he believes that he has the ability to pay his debt. He believes he has the ability to repay what he owes. We, we ran the numbers. We, we know what he owes. A hundred and a hundred plus year, hundred thousand plus years. But he doesn't know the character of the king. 
He trusts in his own power and ability to work off his debts to the king. Well, friends, family, we all have debt that has to be paid back. Romans 3.23, all have sinned. We all have sinned. Romans 6.23 says that we, all have, we, have, we have all earned death and punishment. In other words, we have a debt to pay. Do you have a true understanding of the debt you owe? Do you have a true understanding of forgiveness that you have received? See how quick we, are, we, we forget that, that we look at this parable of the servant and we think, how could he even do that? Like, literally, he leaves the king's palace being forgiven, walks out and starts choking another servant. How could he do that? He was forgiven so much. There's no way I would do that. None. No way. It is easy for us to think that we wouldn't do this with money. But we do it all the time with our, our spiritual lives. See, we, we, we come to church on Sunday and we so quickly forget about the truth that we heard while we're here. We open up God's word and we think, wow, that's really good. That's good truth. You know, I, you know what? I'm going to live differently. That, that, that message has impacted my life. I'm going to live differently. But then we go out, out of this place, out of this building, out of this church, and we completely and totally forget. We forget about God's grace and, and mercy, what it means to us. We forget about how much we've been forgiven. We forget about what life is really about. See, I believe that my prayer is that we be a people who don't quickly forget. So how do you, how do you apply this? Now that we broke it down, now that I made us all feel like little bitty people saying that we were so quickly to forget, how do we change this? How do we apply it to our lives? Two parts. Actually, I'm going to talk about two different types of groups and how, how you can apply it to your life. I'm going to talk about the, the, the believer and the unbeliever. So what we learn from this parable about the unforgiven servant, we're going to talk about to the believer first. So if I'm the believer, this is, this is what you need to know. Who have you not forgiven? Think in your head right now about anyone in your life that you might be holding something against. This baggage will continue to pile up. Until you understand that you were called to forgive them. Because you have been forgiven of so much. To the unbeliever or someone who, who questions their belief in God. I invite you to experience this forgiveness. There is no greater decision to be made this evening than a decision to trust Christ Jesus with your life. I believe that, that he is the, the author of our salvation and you can trust him that his death has paid the, your punishment and your debts and the things that you need to be forgiven. If you're wondering where you will go when you die, then an end to the question this evening is this. Trust in Him. He will forgive you first. And then you can pass it on. To an unbeliever, to, to know what true forgiveness is, you have to experience first yourself. And that's my challenge for you. So now you have to ask the hard question. If I have experienced forgiveness, who do I need to forgive? How do I need to pass it on? 
If you never truly experienced the forgiveness of, of Christ, you need to ask for that forgiveness, that he would come and forgive you of your sins so that you will be able to, to love your enemies, that you'll be able to, to experience and pass on the forgiveness, that the grace and the mercy that you have received. And how do you do that? You seek God. You ask Him for the words, the, the softened heart, the message. So I'm going to close in prayer. But I challenge you, don't just hear the message. Don't just, and this goes for me too, don't just hear the words that I'm saying and listen to them, but, but apply them to your life. I know for me, I left Sunday morning and I was like, that's a really good message, Pastor. I, I really enjoyed it. And thinking, yeah, that was really good. Someone need to hear that. No, we all need to hear that. There's, all, there's always someone that we need to forgive. Let's pray. Lord, first of all, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you, Lord, that you are the ultimate example of forgiveness. No matter what we have gone through, no matter what we have, have experienced personally, the debts that we carry, Lord, you say you lay them down and you paid the price for us. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we pray for the, the unbeliever, the person that's questioning their, their faith in you, Lord, that they'll be able to turn to you and experience true forgiveness. So they're able to forgive others. So Lord, if there's someone that we need to forgive, even if it's ourselves, Lord, I pray you give us the words, the desire, the, the, the hunger, the, the, the drive to go out and to forgive. Well, let us be a, a, a people, a church, a congregation, Lord, that doesn't forget quickly. Lord, we thank you that you have blessed each and every one of us. Lord, that we are, we are no longer slaves to sin because of what you've done on the cross for us. So, Lord, as we, as we go about the rest of this week, Lord, I pray Lord, that, that we would have divine appointments. Lord, that we know the person that we need to forgive, that we would cross paths with them and be able to forgive them. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for those hard moments. We thank you, Lord, that you're shaping us into your image, not our image, because, Lord, uh, we can't do it on our own. I've never seen a statue chiseling itself. So, Lord, continue to mold us. Continue to, to guide us, to shape us into your image of forgiving others. Lord, because you have forgiven much for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, can't wait for you to join us on Sunday morning at, uh, here at WFA. Um, be blessed and have a great week.